Um, in the statistics that uh, came out in April, uh, it is uh, worthy to note that we have more than 6 million people who are affected by uh, Alzheimer's. And, you know, that's a pretty good amount right there. Uh, we have 11 million people that are providing unpaid care for them. And we provide... Um, and there are 16 billion hours, which equals $272 million. So in, in this, you know, country here, uh, that's a lot of caregiving, a lot of people. And one of the many tasks that uh, sometimes fall to the caregivers is taking over a person's finances. So we're going to talk about that and uh, how we can do it and what you need to know and everything in between. All right, uh, just so you know, this project was supported in part by grant number, big number from the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Department of Health and Human Services in Washington. It's really contains only general information on legal, financial, and medical issues and is not meant to take the place of professional advice. And of course, in each state, the laws do vary. I know always changing. So, you know, we, we just want you to know that this is general information. And when you have to consult a legal, financial or medical professional uh, before uh, acting, if necessary. We have a lot of people that were involved in uh, this project, as you can see, everything from uh, financial groups to the Hispanic Council on Aging, uh, Wells Fargo, uh, Stanford Center for Longevity, uh, financial protection bureaus, Alliance for Caregiving, Caregiver Action Network, and some uh, a care partner and Jeff Berghoff, who I happen to know personally. So here are some of the learning objectives. We are going to describe how caregiving affects finances. We are going to list the legal and financial documents caregivers should put in place. We are going to prepare for useful discussions about financial decisions and planning. You know, you just really can't just sit down. You have to have in your mind what you want to accomplish, how you want to start the conversation. You want to identify steps to lower the chance of financial abuse and fraud. And it, although we would like to think that doesn't happen, unfortunately, it does. And we need to begin to create a backup plan in case you can no longer provide care. So we have to think ahead for what might happen down the road. Here are some key terms. A family member, friend, or legal guardian who supports someone with their health needs and well-being. Okay, that's one definition of a caregiver or care partner. It is also someone who manages money or pays for the expenses of another person. So let's just click on finance and see what that has to say. Money and things, uh, finances are money and things that are worth money. Financial literacy is understanding how to manage money from handling day-to-day -day expenses to planning for the future. So we're going to talk about the costs of caregiving. Financial literacy is especially important for caregivers because it provides them with the knowledge and skills needed to better support themselves and others. Let's check our knowledge. What percentage of caregivers have out-of-pocket costs as a result of caregiving. Our choices are 47%, 67%, 78%, and 95%. And the answer is 78%. More than three quarters of caregivers have out-of-pocket costs 
as a result of caregiving, including household and medical expenses. And I can attest to that myself, having uh, given out of pocket of having paid for things for my mom um, that nothing really paid for. So it is true. Let's talk about the impact it has on the caregiver on employment. Uh, caregiving may affect employment. Many caregivers end up reducing hours, taking time off, retiring early, or quitting their jobs. This then can increase debt, make it hard to save for retirement, or means cutting back on other costs. And I too had to make a decision, my mom or my job. Impact on health. And I'm talking about you, the caregiver. Caregiver, caregiving can have a major impact on one's own health. When caregivers don't take care of themselves, it can lead to additional medical expenses. And unfortunately, caregivers do put off taking care of their own needs. One of the things that uh, I talk about when I have a support group, one of the first things is, what are you doing for yourself? You know, I, they are all involved, uh, you know, almost 24 hours a day, but I'm concerned about you. What are you doing for yourself? Do you get any breaks? Do you, you know, need some help in, in what to do for yourself? Uh, very important. Caregiver can't get sick because then we need two people to provide care for that family. How Alzheimer's disease affects finances. Okay, let's check our knowledge again. Alzheimer's is a normal part of aging. True or false? Well, the answer is false. It is not a normal part of aging. It is a progressive and fatal brain disease, not a normal part part of aging. I will tell you nothing that makes me more nuts than when somebody says, oh, I went to the doctor and they said, you know, my memory problems are, are uh, normal for old age. Drives me crazy because for the most part, you know, it's not. When you have a memory problem that's not Alzheimer's or not dementia, you know, it's you can't remember something, but later on you remember it or you couldn't find something, but then you backtracked. You know, there's a big difference. Alzheimer's only affects a person's memory. True or false? False. Why is it false? Because Alzheimer's impacts a person's memory, thinking, and behavior. This includes their ability to manage money. So, you know, it is more than memory. It has to do with understanding, um, you know, and being able to do everyday activities, including manage money. Alzheimer's usually progresses slowly in three stages. An individual with Alzheimer's usually usually lives four to eight years after diagnosis. Uh, I have seen them live longer than that, although it does depend when diagnosed. As the person advances through the disease, care needs increase, and so does the cost of care. Um, click on early. Let's see if it tells us any more. The impact on the ability to manage money. Now, in the beginning, people may have trouble managing their money or remembering to pay their bills. But as the disease gets worse, they will no longer be able to communicate their wishes or make financial decisions. So that is one of the reasons early planning is really so good. It allows the person to participate in decisions about their finances and future care. And really, you know, what we mean is they can they can help make decisions while they can still understand and, you know, be a part of that decision. Um, 
My Aunt Mabel waited way too long because she didn't trust anybody else with her money. Um, and then when she, she did need me to take it over, it was very difficult because, oh, yeah, you know, da, 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 and then, you know, you'd get somewhere. Oh, no, I, I didn't tell her. So early planning with everything is the best thing. Let's talk about the financial impact on caregivers. We have talked about their income goes down and their expenses go up. So let's hear from a caregiver. So when we finally moved in, into assisted living, when we first got the cost, it was going to be $5,000 a month. When we started adding on um, daily medications and housekeeping and all the other things that come with it, we were quickly at $6,000 per month. In my mind, every month I was you know, doing the calculations of, all right, how much money does dad have left? How long can this last? What happens when that goes away? Some unique challenges for the caregivers. So first thing is money. You know, dementia caregivers have twice the average out-of-pocket caregiving costs. You know, there are a lot of needs and uh, a lot of care that is needed. So that really kind of accounts for that. 30 to 40% of dementia caregivers experience depression. And, you know, while depression in some people is comes, but it goes, um, if it stays and it stays for a period of time, you really need to do something about that. Uh, one of the things, again, in my support groups, I talk about the person, you know, do they have depression? Do they have anxiety? Um, and what are you doing about it? And you need to do something about it. And uh, on the other side of depression, caregivers have anxiety. 44% of them have anxiety. And the same thing, what are you doing about it? And if it has existed for a period of time, talk to your, your doctor, your physician. And women are more likely to experience the stress of caregiving. I think that's because we take on the the majority of caregiving and it's not easy. You know, your your day is not yours and you never know each day what's going to happen. And it is very, very stressful. We're going to check our knowledge again. People younger than 65 can develop Alzheimer's true or false. The answer is true. There is something called early onset, um, and people younger than 65 can also develop Alzheimer's, but it's much less common. Although I will say, you know, at when I was uh, at the daycare uh, for people with Alzheimer's and dementia, it seemed to me we were getting a, a good percent of people with that early onset. And their problems are so much different than the average, I want to say average, person with dementia and Alzheimer's because they're young. They were building their careers. They have young families. And yet, you know, they got to a point where they can't function. And, um, you know, it, uh, it is more, it is less common, but I am seeing it more and more. Some additional financial challenges. People living with younger onset Alzheimer's face additional financial challenges, and many report losing or quitting one or more jobs because cognitive changes affected their work. As a result, some of them are not able to maximize benefits such as disability insurance, FMLA protections, or COBRA. And people living with younger onset Alzheimer's and their care, pa care partners have less time to plan for the future, including saving for retirement. But let me say that uh, to anyone you know that's working and diagnosed with early onset, don't quit your job because then you are not entitled to benefits. Go talk to your HR department and they will tell you to, you know, contact uh, uh, the disability uh, of your state and uh, 
you are entitled to disability. And later on, you are entitled. Uh, it is one of the diagnoses in which you can get benefits. So that's our younger onset financial challenges. Uh, care partners for these individuals really face unique financial challenges. The other partner may have to return to work or increase hours or get another job to make up for loss of income. And think about it, you know, their, uh, their partner who now has been diagnosed, a lot of times you can't leave them home alone or you can't leave them when your kids are home. And that becomes quite the dilemma and it, maybe it's why we saw so many in our uh, daycare for Alzheimer's and dementia. Many still have children at home and face increased costs of raising a family. And one is no longer able to save for children's education and other family expenses. And probably most of them still have mortgages, car payments, loans, and debt. There are many resources for assistance and support, but they're only available if you're 65 or older. And there is a two-year waiting period between Social Security disability income and Medicare eligibility. And that, of course, can impact an entire family's uh, coverage. So pretty scary. Let's look at the LGBTQ. Okay, more people, more are likely to be single. Of course, financial challenges, that is definitely one. Often live alone and are less likely to have children. A person living with Alzheimer's will eventually need someone else to take over paying bills and making other financial decisions. You know, so, you know, that could be a dilemma without, you know, having someone immediate in family. Financial plans help make sure non-related caregivers can access the person's money when the person needs help managing it. So those are certainly some of the financial challenges for the LGBTQ population. Now let's look at the low income person. They are less likely to be financially prepared for the costs of caregiving. They may have few, fewer opportunities to save for the future. They may struggle to pay bills, cover medical expenses and care costs, and they may have increased debt. Added caregiver stress, but less ability to pay for resources that can provide relief. They may qualify for services that are offered at little or no cost or at a reduced rate. Some benefits of early planning, and there are benefits of early planning, but let's check on knowledge. Who can benefit from putting financial plans in place for the future? Is it people with a lot of money? People retiring soon? Caregivers, low income households, or everyone. And of course, everyone can benefit from putting financial plans in place for the future. And even those who are living with or caring for someone with a disease or chronic illness can benefit from this. So, more benefits for early planning. And this is for the caregiver, knowing the person's wishes. Right? It's really important if you're going to be helping them know what they want. Feeling more confident, making important decisions, knowing how to handle financial issues and pay for care, and uh, less chance of making costly or unwise decisions. So this early care planning is so important. It's so important for everyone. That includes you and me. Uh, let's hear from our expert. One of the benefits of putting financial plans in place for caregivers is simply peace of mind. Oftentimes we have a lot of anxiety and fear about the unknown. How long is the disease going to last? 
What are the care needs going to be? When we think of all of those things that we might be apprehensive about and we put plans in place for if this happens, here's how we'll handle it. And we really think through, here's what's typical with the disease. Here's what I need to be thinking about. And here's my plan for that. It can be such a gift to the whole family because people can settle in and focus on, here's what I need to focus on today. Here's what I need to think about right now without the weight of the what ifs hanging over their head. Benefits of early planning, again, for the caregiver, know their wishes, feel more confident making decisions, know how to handle financial issues and pay for care, and less chance of making costly or unwise decisions. Now let's hear from a caregiver about that. My mother, by putting plans in place early, that really helped me because it gives me a sense of confidence that I'm doing the things that she really wants to be done. It allows me to not have to worry about decisions that I make because my mother has already laid out the plan. She's stated her wishes and my role is really to execute those plans. I find, I have found that making decisions for my own situation can often be difficult. And so it's even harder to make decisions, especially when it comes to medical decisions, financial decisions, to have that responsibility of making those decisions for someone else can be very, very difficult. So in that my mother was so prepared and um, had laid out financial plans and really had a structure around her life that has really allowed me to be less anxious as I perform the caregiving role. And, you know, it's really important, uh, not just for people who have Alzheimer's and dementia, but for all of us. You know, we should all know and make plans while we can make sure somebody knows what they are, um, you know, just for everyday living and change those periodically because our lives change or our place in life changes. So these are important things for everyone to know. Okay, so let's talk about some more benefits of early planning, but now it's for the individual. They have, it provides the ability to share exactly what they want and help make decisions. It is reassurance that others know their wishes and will follow them. And it's relief from having legal and financial plans in place. You know, just doing it, you know, at your points of life is great. But when then you come down with uh, an illness that could be terminal, knowing that everything is in place ahead of time, really does provide a a tiny bit of relief in the situation. Again, let's hear from our expert. One benefit of planning early for the person with the disease is that they get to have their say. They get to say, here is how I want things to play out. If there's ever a time when I can't live alone or when I need this kind of care, here's how I'd like that to happen. Here's who I want to be making decisions on my behalf if I can't make them for myself. So they get to have their say. In addition, they get to make choices about how they live their life, what they do now and in the months and years to come with this additional knowledge of, hey, I've got this disease and here's what I can expect. And so a lot of people tell us that they choose differently and and they choose differently from each other. I talked to one person with Alzheimer's who said, you know what? I want every day to be regular. I want to work in my flower beds. I want to play with my grandkids. I want to have lunch with a friend. I just want lots of great regular days. I've talked to other folks with dementia diseases who said, I want to do the things I've been looking forward to. I want to take some big trips or I want to do some really special things with the people I'm close to. So it's not the same for everybody, but the person with the disease gets to make choices and gets to live life more on their terms. 
And I can't say it better than that. It's so important. All right. So now we're going to have some conversations about finances. Financial discussions means talking about money. Money can make people feel anxious or uncomfortable, making it hard to know how to start the conversation. So how do you start a conversation when you want to talk about money and, you know, what plans they have in place? So we're going to learn how to do that. We're going to start with writing down your goals and what documents you will review or discuss. You want to include trusted family members or close friends now, you want to pick the right time of day. So you want to choose a calm time of the day and a quiet place. You know, for some people, they get up and they're not, they're, you know, they're grumpy, whatever. So they have those cups of coffee. So first thing in the morning might not be good for them. While other people, they start out the day great. And as the end of the day comes, it's not good for them. So you need to know your person and you need to pick a calm time of the day. And then you need to pick a quiet place, a place where people aren't running in and out or disturbing. And, you know, it's a place where you can have a conversation without interruptions. Encourage honesty on both sides. You know, what do you want? What are your fears? What are your plans? And don't rush. Take your time. You may not be able to get all of the discussions done at one time. So tackle one thing and then say another day we'll go over this. There's really no reason to rush. Here are some additional tips. Know that it can be hard to ask for help managing finances finances, especially for someone living with dementia, and that is so true. Ask about the person's wishes and don't judge the person in their decisions. Now, if the person has difficulty communicating, speak in short sentences and pause to make sure they understand what is being said. And this is a really helpful tip all the time, whenever you're having a conversation. Don't give big, long sentences with lots of different subjects in them. Speak short, one point, and then stop and make sure they understand before going on to another point um, for any communication. But of course, especially when talking about financial situations. Now, if the conversation becomes stressful, stop. Try again a different time. It's okay. You've got time. You can't do it all at once. Try to end on a positive note, meaning, you know, don't say, well, we couldn't get anything done today. We'll try another day. But the opposite. Oh, we did very well today. We'll continue, you know, whatever day chosen. Right. And positive because that's what they're going to remember. If you end negatively, that they'll remember. And make sure you check in regularly. So let's hear from a caregiver. Advice I'd have for other caregivers if the um, conversation about finances doesn't go well at first is to keep trying. It took a while for my mom to come around and I was exasperated. Um, I would try to catch her at a good moment. And sometimes she'd give me a little tidbit here or there. So it might take time to just pull it all together. It's sort of trying to understand the moment if it's you're having a good time. What I did also was to bring up friends. My mother was very empathetic. So if I'd say, oh, remember so-and-so? They had a situation with their mom or dad or family member where something happened and the person didn't know what to do or they didn't have understanding about it. So that was really hard on them. She'd say, oh, really? And I'd say, yeah, see, that would help me if, you know, we talked about that kind of thing. And that would usually get her. So in my case, that empathy is what I would kind of try to use for her to open up more, but continuing to do it, catching on a good day. um, That's, that was key because it it took time and it was piecemeal, small victories, just get as much as you can over time and keep at it. Cause there usually will be a window where you can kind of break through, or in some cases it might be 
someone else has to talk to them. So let's start with a positive statement. I have always admired the way you handle your finances. I want to learn more about what works well for you. So remember, we want to start positive. We don't want to start negative. I've noticed you seem worried about finances these days. What worries you the most? What can I do to help? And another positive statement, I respect your privacy, but it would give me peace of mind to know if you have financial plans in place so I can follow your wishes. And that's a great statement. So let's start a conversation about your own financial wishes. A positive statement would be, I want to talk with you about my finances so you can access them in case of an emergency. Or another statement, I really want you to understand my wishes for the future. Now, let's talk about how I want my finances managed. And before we go to the activity, I will say that I have done that with my family, especially with my daughters, how and what and where and all that. Uh, Not enough just to write it down. They have to know where things are. All right. Let's look at the activity. Let's start at the top. Um, We're going to have some conversations about finances. And when starting a conversation, it can be helpful to prepare in advance. So this worksheet will help you create a plan for the conversation, including what you hope to accomplish, when and where the conversation should take place, and what will you say. So you want to really know in your mind. And then from your mind, write it down. So what are your goals for the conversation? You have to know what you're going into the conversation wanting uh, as an outcome. What financial documents will you want to review or discuss? What trusted family member or close friends should be a part of the conversation? And note that these should be people um, that the person living with the disease trusts or who knows about the person's medical and financial situation. And my Aunt Mabel, who I briefly mentioned, we had my mother-in-law. They were friends. They lived together. So it was important. It is important to have someone else listen and know. What is the best time of day for the person to have the conversation. And we talked about that before. You know, what's the calmest part of the day? And that's the time of the day you want to pick. And what can you talk? Where can you talk that will be quiet enough to minimize stress or anxiety? And again, a quiet room. You don't want people running in and out. Uh, No TVs on or anything else on. A quiet room where you can have a conversation and, you know, it's quiet and peaceful. Now, some conversation starters (coughs) begin with that positive statement we talked about. It builds confidence and connection with the person. So, for example, I have always admired the the way you handle your finances. And these were uh, something we talked about before. I want to be respectful of your privacy, but it gives me peace of mind to know your plan in place. And third one, I've noticed you seem worried about finances these days. What worries you the most? What can I do to help? And then write down something that you might use to start this conversation. Some tips for positive, productive conversations about finances. Be patient and understanding. It can be hard to ask for help, um, you know, help managing finances, especially for someone living with dementia. It's hard for anybody to ask for help. Don't judge the person and their decisions. Everyone manages money in their own way. The goal is to come to an agreement on how the person's money will be managed from now on. Explain that you'd like to get a clear picture of the person's assets and expenses as well as what's important to them. Focus on the easy things first, the easy wins 
Don't make assumptions about the person's ability to communicate or participate. Um, the disease does affect each person differently, and people can uh, take a part in that conversation. But if the person has difficulty communicating, it may be helpful to use short sentences and simple terms. And again, that's useful all the time. Pause at times to make sure you are understanding each other correctly. If the discussion becomes stressful, take a break and try talking later. It's okay. I mean, you don't have to get it done all at once. It can be done in pieces. Try to end on that positive note. That's what they're going to remember. They want to remember that, oh, we did good today. We're going to continue a different day. Positive. If the individual does not need help, you know, help to frame, help, help to frame the conversation as what if or if things were to change and plan to discuss finances at least once a year or when there is a major change in the person's situation. And again, everyone should do that. Um, life changes. You may have filled out all these things when you had kids and now you uh, your kids are grown. You're in a different place, uh, but you never change your papers. Uh, it's important to look at them frequently. Avoiding financial abuse and fraud. So check your knowledge. On average, how much money do Americans age 80 and older lose each year as a result of financial abuse, fraud, and scams? Is it 5,200, 10,500? 15,700 or 39,200? The answer is 39,200. Amazing, huh? Studies show that financial exploitation is the most common form of elder abuse, and yet only a small fraction of these incidents are reported. Financial abuse and dementia. Financial abuse can occur in any setting. Individuals living with dementia have a greater risk of becoming victims. They may not remember or report the abuse, and they may struggle to make good financial decisions. So let's hear from an expert. People living with dementia are more susceptible perhaps to fraud and financial abuse than other people because they have a, a disease that's attacking their brain. And so their, their ability to solve problems, to think about things logically, to have insight may be impaired and they may be able to be uh, tricked by people they trust or people who seem nice or seem trustworthy in a way that they wouldn't have been at an earlier time. Signs a person may ha be having troubles with money. Well, they may have unopened bills, or they may have electricity or gas get shut off, or unusual or large purchases, or multiple of the same item or things they don't need, repeat donations to telemarketers, or missing money or unexplained bank withdrawals. And maybe you know people uh, that you uh, have shown these signs, lowering the risk of abuse and fraud. So here are some things we can do. Agree to a spending limit on credit cards. And you can certainly call the credit card and put that limit on. Or create a separate account for recreational spending. Or you can set up auto pay for bills, set up automatic notifications for withdrawals or large charges, request electronic bank and credit card statements, sign up for the do not call list at do not call .gov, and ask credit card companies to stop sending balance transfer checks. So let's look at the activity. Here's like a checklist that you can follow 
uh, for steps to reducing financial abuse and fraud. And this first uh, section uh, really goes over what we just, what I just said before. If you suspect financial abuse or fraud, call the bank or call the credit card company. Don't wait. Reset personal identification numbers and online account passwords. Request a, few, a free security freeze, which restricts access to a credit file, making it harder to identify thieves to open up accounts in a person's name. And you will have to contact each of the three credit reporting companies, uh, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion, to place a freeze. A security freeze will not be lifted until you request it. And if you suspect someone is being financially abused by a person they know, contact Adult Pr Protective Services, which is a confidential uh, and available in every state. And to find your local APS, visit eldercare.acl.government or call 800-677-1116, right? So there's plenty of places you can get information on what to do. Things that I did, my father was very proud. Uh, he really didn't want to admit that he had Alzheimer's. So I wanted him to be able to still feel, to continue to feel good about himself. So I actually set up a checking savings account for him uh, that uh, was joint with me. Because again, I had power of attorney, so I could move things around a bit. I made sure that he always had two hundred dollars in that account. Everything else was protected, and he really didn't have access to it anymore. He didn't know that because he had that two hundred dollars. Uh, a couple of years into his diagnosis, he actually had somebody stop at his home. He was outside working in his yard. They came by a couple um, old. Uh, car and pulled up to the driveway. They had a child with them and said their child was ill. And they said they needed money for health care for this child. My father was always very generous as he became older and as he became more impaired with Alzheimer's, he became more generous. And so his inclination was to help this couple. They took him to the credit union. They asked him to withdraw all of his funds. So he did. He had access to that $200 that he knew about, um, and he gave it to them. They left him there in the parking lot. He walked home. So it was really awful that that happened to him, um, but his money was protected because of the safeguards that we had put up. Everything else was still there, and I was able to replace that $200. So uh, we tried very hard to do everything we could to protect him financially, but also to make sure that we didn't take away his sense of self-esteem. Identifying financial and legal needs. And we have some choices here. Organizing finances. Stress and lack of time often prevent people from making financial or legal plans. You can make the process easier by breaking things into steps and do one task at a time. You can take many of these action steps without a financial advisor or attorney. So in our first step, we're going to look at income and spending. Write down the cash in and the cash out. See if there are any places to cut back on spending and build up savings for that unexpected care cost. So let's hear from a caregiver uh, first on how they do it. I would suggest is when you have those monthly bills is is to call. Um, I had cable <laughs> and I said, hey, I, 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 I can't pay this amount when I'm looking at all of the bills that we had and they didn't want to lose me as a customer. So they reduced the cost of the of the cable. Um, also. The medical bills, even though you get a demand for payment for a certain amount of money, call them, go on the payment plan, talk to the hospital about the payment plan, talk to the different um, utilities. I was on a, a budget for heat. I was on a budget for electricity. Reach out and ask um, and don't do all those calls at one day. Break it up and do one at a time so you don't get overwhelmed with it. 
Very good ideas. Let's hear from the second caregiver. Keeping within a budget. The budget is really, really important for uh, for food because it's very tempting to go into a grocery store and find all kinds of delicacies. So that's that's been a big change and a good one. We found that for the two of us, we were spending a lot of money on groceries. So taking a look at that has, has really helped. Okay. Let's take a look at the second step, taking inventory of assets and debts. So assets is anything you own that has value, like a house, a car, your bank account, or stock. Debt is money that is borrowed and paid back over time, like credit cards and loans. So, you know, you want to take a look at everything that you have and everything that you owe and hope that it comes out with you having more than you owe. Let's identify the course of care. Course of care have, may include ongoing medical treatment, prescription drugs, personal care supplies, adult day services, in-home care services, and full-time residential care services. And even if right now, just my little advice, if you are in adult day services, you know, kind of look ahead, you know, plan ahead because things will change and you need to know that you can take care of that full-time residential care services. And our fourth step, make arrangements for ongoing financial responsibilities. So um, what that means is the responsibilities of paying bills, arranging for benefit claims, making investment decisions, and preparing tax returns. So take, let's take a look at the activity that uh, we can use. So when, when you create a monthly budget, there are lots of things you need to consider. You need to list your income, which is on the left-hand side of this form. You need to list expenses in the teal column on the right-hand side. And then in the purple box at the bottom, you have listed, uh, you know, you have your total income and your total expenses, and it equals, and as I said, you, the total income should be more than the total expenses so that there is money left to save or spend. And if the total expenses are more than the total income, then you need to look for possible ways to reduce expenses. So it's a good, it's really a good thing to do for everybody. Okay, so now we can create that monthly budget. For expenses to consider when creating a monthly budget. So when you talk about housing, we're talking about rent, mortgage, or residential care services such as nursing home or assisted living. If we're talking about utilities, we want to include electricity, gas, water, sewer, home security, garbage removal, and any maintenance or repairs. So think about, you know, all the things included, not just electrical gas, medical expenses, you know, did you need grab bars put in, medicine dispensers, incontinence products, and they are very expensive, prescription drugs, also medical bills or other payments to care providers. Entertainment, depending upon the stage you're in, movies, concerts, sporting events, and live theater. Now, transportation, we are looking at car payments or bus and taxi fare for people who don't drive, licensing, fuel, which, of course, in today's world is pretty expensive, and other, whatever other might be. Debt payments, personal, could be student loans credit cards, and then personal care, hair and nails, clothing, joy cleaning, and gym or health club memberships. And finally, insurance. And there are many types of insurance. We have home insurance and healthcare insurance and life insurance and auto insurance and maybe other 
other, we have long-term care insurance. So there's different types of insurances uh, that is there. So in, if we're trying to reduce monthly expenses, all right, take a look at shopping, you know, shop, uh, shop at discount places, watch the prices, take advantage of coupons, uh, entertainment, borrow books and movies from the library, don't buy them, or wait until they are available to watch at home, which does come pretty quickly these days. Bring your own drinks and snacks when out for entertainment. Uh, discontinue, downgrade, or negotiate lower rates for cable, internet, and cell phone. And you can always negotiate a lower rate. Downsize vacations or travel. And travel during the off-season. Transportation, again, if you don't drive or, you know, if you're driving still, you can carpool, use public transportation. Join a rewards program that offers discounts on gasoline or check online to find the cheapest gas. Raise auto insurance deductibles or reduce coverage on older cars. And these are the little things people don't realize that you can lower the cost you know, uh, buy used vehicles instead of new. Some people now, uh, you know, buy um, the ones that they, you know, use. I forgot the word. And uh, you give back after a couple of years. Sell vehicles no longer needed. Right? If only one person's driving, you only need one vehicle. Housing stay on top of home maintenance. Uh, it avoids costly repairs. And of course, if you want to sell later on, it's much better to have your house in, uh, you know, without any major things to be repaired. Challenge property tax assessments, look into property tax breaks for seniors, uh, homeowner exemptions, and don't forget veterans. There are many um, exemptions if one or both have been a veteran. Refinance mortgages to a lower interest rate when that does happen and consider downsizing your home or moving to a less expensive area. Well, we have all these financial uh, ways to, um, to lower expenses. Only have one credit card and pay it off every month. Shop for lower auto and homeowner insurance rates and you know, ask about bundling. They are generally um, a little cheaper if you bundle all your insurance. Sell things that aren't needed or donate them for a tax write-off. Compare banks and credit unions. Set up a budget and stick to it. General, switch to energy-efficient bulbs or appliances and um, you'll be surprised how much that saves. Make your own coffee or meals at home instead of going to coffee shops, Dunkin' Donuts, uh, or wherever every morning. Review medical and dental policies for opportunities to reduce premiums. Treat dining out as a luxury, not a habit, and only charge what you can repay in full each month. Now, medical, choose in-network medical and dental providers. It certainly is uh, much better as far as pricing goes. Call the phone number on medical billing statements to negotiate a lower balance. Save on prescriptions by considering mail order or a 90-day supply and ask your doctor about generic medications. And I can tell you that mail order overall for for us, my, my husband and I, have much cheaper. And I I only know that because we've I've done it recently. Find a pharmaceutical assistance program that may help. And there is uh, some that are advertised and even advertised in doctor's offices. And finally, take advantage of health care savings and flexible spending accounts when available through some employers. All right, so that's how we can reduce expenses. So let's look at some common funding sources. 
personal resources, uh, if you're working, your income, your 401k or other retirement accounts, uh, savings, stocks, bonds, and personal property. Now, federally funded resources, of course, we have our Medicare Part A, B, and D. Veterans benefits, know the veterans benefits if you or your loved one has been a veteran. Uh, even if one was a veteran um, and passes away, the other spouse is still entitled to benefits. Social Security Disability Insurance, all right? We know that uh, if one was working and goes out, um, because of an illness, they are entitled to disability insurance and compassionate allowance initiative, which identifies claims where the applicant's disease or condition meets Social Security standards for disability. So these are people younger uh, working and find out that they have dementia, one of the dementias or Alzheimer's, and that qualifies for disability. That's why don't quit your job, you know, contact uh, your HR department and look into the compassionate allowance uh, plans. And Medicaid and Medigap, those are additional resources at benefitscheckup.org. Medicaid, we know, uh, is for someone that's under uh, a certain income. Now, let's organize our legal plan. So here are some tips for uh, legal planning. Legal planning makes sure a person can designate a trusted family member or friend to make decisions for them and making legal plans as early as you can so that everyone is well prepared. Get advice from an attorney can be helpful. Uh, there are some forms that you may be able to complete on your own. So let's hear from a caregiver. Most of these resources you can access online. You can access from multiple different um, entities. And I did most of all of her um, documents that were necessary, the power of attorney, um, the living will, the health care power, power of attorney, the financial power of attorney, all of those things you can access and you can get them um, notarized and, and, and legal documents created. So don't let that be a hindrance to take care of those items because those items are really, really important early on in the disease. If you wait, it's only going to cause more problems. So the earlier you get it, the better. And uh, don't be afraid of the nuances of all these documents and all these papers. It's pretty simplified if you research it. It's, there's a really simple way to go about it and take care of it as soon as possible. Uh, review and update documents. Take inventory of and review legal documents that are already in place and make updates if necessary. At the very least, make sure you have these documents in place and that they are up to date. Your durable power of attorney for both finances and health care and living well. And let me say this should be done at different points in your life um, because your life changes over the years. You know, you're young, you have kids and you make make documents, but then they're out of the house, grown up, and it's, you know, just two of you, you really do need to review them at different stages of your life. Now let's look at the activity. To find professionals near you, visit these resources. We have legal resources and we have financial resources. A lot of them you can um, you can contact the Alzheimer's Association and the 24-7 helpline. And um, in, in your areas, uh, there's a lot of them, as you can see. Um, and feel, you know, look up uh, the type of resource that you need. Creating a backup plan. I always call that plan A, B, C, D. Always have a backup plan. 
So you want to talk with friends and family about who could take over different caregiving responsibilities. Consider assigning responsibilities to more than one person, and certainly in families where there are multiple uh, people who can uh, help, uh, it's a great idea to do that. Designate a trusted backup agent for the person's power of attorney and keep an up-to-date list of medical information uh, on the person that includes medications and contact information for doctors and anyone else involved in the person's care. And keep that list where everyone knows where to find it. And please take care of your health. As a caregiver, the best thing you can do for the person you are caring for is stay physically and emotionally strong. And remember in the beginning, I said, I am always concerned about you when I have my groups. What are you doing for yourself? Visit the doctor regularly. Eat well and stay physically active. Look into respite care or other support services. Ask for and accept help from others. I know it's hard to do sometimes, but people that offer help, accept it. Build a care team to assist with caregiving responsibilities. And a care team is anything from your medical team to your community team, your family team, all the people that are and can be involved to help you. The Alzheimer's Association is available wherever and whenever you need reliable information and support. You can call any time, 24-7, the helpline, the number being 800-272-3900. It is free. It operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week. A real person will answer the phone, will listen to your needs, and help you find what you are looking for. Online, you can uh, type in alz.org. And in communities everywhere, alz.org slash community resource finder, a great uh, resource for everyone as you look for uh, things to help you. Let's hear from our experts. Even if you have a financial plan in place, you can still find yourself challenged by the day-to-day -day financial realities. And if a person feels overwhelmed or needs help, there's so much help available through the Alzheimer's Association. That's a great place to start. You can get a lot of information on our website at alz.org. You can also call our 24-hour helpline at 1-800-272-3900. We're staffed around the clock. We We've got dementia care experts, master's level counselors and social workers who are ready to talk when you are and are happy to talk through whatever issues you're going through. So next steps, I want you to write down one or two action steps you plan to take after today's program. So for example, you might write I will complete the worksheets from today's presentation. It's really a good start and we'll then provide you a guide as to what to do next. Support public libraries. Like, share, and subscribe for more great videos.